Hey y'all, Coach Rita Fight here. Got the whole family with me. Hello. Hello. In today's class, we're going to be looking at the Shepherd of Hermes, his first book called Visions. Mm hmm. Visions 1. Visions 1. All right, so in this class, we're going to be looking at the William Wake translation. It's the same translation that you'll find if you look in the Lost Books of the Bible and the Forgotten Books of Eden for the Shepherd of Hermes. Now, we can find a digital copy of the William Wake edition. If you put in the Shepherd of Hermes William Wake, you'll come up with a website that looks kind of like this one. It's called uh, the Shepherd of Hermes Wiki Source. The free online library is what we're looking for. And when we click on it, we'll see the opportunity to get the William Wake edition or the William Wake translation of the Bible. Now, I believe that this is the best one. But if you disagree and like the other translations, those are available too. There's at least two more de uh, translations, one by Donaldson and one by Lightfoot. Yeah, well, one of the things that I would advise people is to try and get a, if possible, to try and get that paperback um, copy of the Lost Books of the Bible. Yeah, so, and that's what it looks like if you try to purchase it. looks like the price of it that went up. Yeah, when I saw that, I was like, and do a double take, the price of that book has went up a lot. This looks like the one you have on your shelf, $650. Yeah, we didn't pay $650 for it. Though, but well, that's the way me. yours looks. Yeah. This has got a must be right here. I paid about $8 to $15 for this one. It looks like that. Yeah. But anyway, let's go over and let's look at a digital copy. This one you can actually download to your computer. It's probably a way you could download it to your computer. But we're going to go down through here. And so how are we going to do it? We're going to touch verse by verse, line by line. You need us a reader, and um, then we'll just let the Lord lead us as we go. Who wants to read? I'll read. Yeah. All right, so we're, we're at the first part of the book of Hermes called His Vision. We're in Vision 1. So in Vision 1, we're going to be talking about against filthy and proud thoughts. And then on verse 20, we're going to cover also the re neglect of Hermes and chastising his children. So basically he's going to talk to this Hermes character and explain to him what he's doing wrong in life. Yeah. And mm -hmm. this has a lot to do with the rest of us as well. Yeah. So because we're all like kind of a Hermes and so we sh we will get a lot out of this. Alright, go ahead. Journey. He who had bred me up sold a certain young maid to Rome whom when I saw many years after I remembered her and began to love her as a sister. It happened sometime afterwards that I saw her washing in the river, Tyre, and I reached out my hand unto her and brought her out of the river. So in this verse, which is uh, being introduced to the lady who Hermes, um, who was a companion, a friend um, of Hermes. Well, it seems as though like Hermes was like a slave or some type of servant. And this lady here, she could have also been some type of a servant, but it seems like she may have been the daughter of or the something to do with the slave master or the servant master or something like that. She's she's kind of maybe her, like a little bit over Hermes. Yeah, Hermes is subordinate to her in some way. Mm -hmm. But he's seeing her again after the after he had this experience back there in Rome. Now he's seeing her again and she's in the river Tiber taking a bath. Mm -hmm. Number two. And when I saw her, I thought with myself, saying, How happy should I be if I had such a wife, both for beauty and manners? This I thought with myself, nor did I think anything more. But not long after, as I was walking and musing on these thoughts, I began to honor this creature of God. Thinking with myself, how noble and beautiful she was. So right here, um, we're talking about just Hermas having thoughts of her. I think he was just having friendly thoughts of her. He's letting us know that he wasn't thinking anything that was um, foul or anything. But um, as we know, when you start to just have thoughts about 
people, those thoughts can prolong and, you know, you start thinking other things. No, nah, he was having some foul thoughts. He's talking about how, <laughs> he, how beautiful she is and how he would love to have a wife like this. Yeah, yeah but, but he married was, it. He over here married, but he's thinking, oh, she look, she looking fine. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. he was talking about her manners as well. So, yeah, he gonna make a wife out of this one. Yeah, he like, he like Chris said, even though he got a, he got a wife at home, He's looking at this one, going, "Yeah, how how blessed I'd be if I had this one for a wife." That's that's in the air. He's messed up. He's messing up. Well, you know, at this time, um, I think you know people were practicing polygamy, so <laughs> you know maybe he was thinking about adding oh, hair to his wife. I don't know about that. I don't know why this was no. this was during the time of Paul and John and. And Peter and those guys, as they was writing their books of the yeah, New Testament, yeah, I don't yeah, know yeah. that polygamy was such a big thing back then. You thinking about Moses and uh, Jacob and Abraham and them guys. Mm -hmm. Okay. And when I walked a little, I fell asleep. And the Spirit caught me away and carried me through a certain place towards the right hand through which no man could pass. It was a place among rocks. Very steep and unpassable for water. So Hermes, I believe, just fell asleep. And what we know now is that um, that he fell into a dream or a trance. Yeah, and that's very important to understand at the beginning of this story. In visions, he's actually dreaming. Because later on, they're going to expound on what he sees by way of this this night vision, as we would call it, or a dream, as he was called. He would call. But later on, he ain't dreaming. Later on, you know, when you get to similitudes, he's already wide awake. He's seeing this stuff firsthand. Mm -hmm. But over here, in visions, he's asleep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And his, his dream is just more vivid than, you know, what we would think a dream is. Because sometimes it seems like he's explaining it where he's awake, but we have to remember that this is just a dream. Yeah, but you also have to remember where our dreams come from. And for Hermes to be receiving this dream in this manner, um, it was divine. It was, you know, it was done in a way that he could actually go on to write this very important book. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. so... You know, some of our dreams we remember years and we remember the details of it long, you know, after the dream. That's because those were important dreams. So would you compare this dream, this trance, like that one of John and Revelations? Um, yeah, because John and many and many of the um, um, portions of the book of Revelation, he was actually sleeping. If not all of it, I know a lot of it, He would, John was asleep. It was a, what we would call a night vision or a dream. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But the, the, the scripture, it, it rarely ever talks about dreams separated from visions. It's like, it, as far as the Bible is concerned, a dream and a vision is, is synonymous. Yeah. Mm -hmm. One is a vision in the day and the other one is a vision in the night. Not necessarily because it could very well be, but a lot of times when it's talking about somebody having a vision, it's talking about a night vision. Not many of them had their visions while awake. Some of them did. Some of them did. Some of the prophets had their, had a vision while they were awake. Yes. But a lot of them, like even Daniel, um, which are probably the some most important visions in the scripture, most of those visions took place at nighttime. Yeah. And those are still happening today, right? What do you mean? Dreams, visions. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. That's part of the prophecy is that the old men will dream dreams and the young men will have visions where we're talking about the same thing. That, you know, Hermes is seeing here, same kind of thing that Hermes is seeing here. This is actually supposed to increase. More yeah. And, more. and we, you know, we're going to move on. But, you know, our children, um, we've had experienced a lot of them having um, dreams, visions where we can, they, you know, sit around and talk about them and we can see them being fulfilled. When I was past this place, I came into a plane and there falling upon my knees. I began to pray unto the Lord and confess my sins. Okay, so he's in this vision, and you notice back up there in verse three, he in this while he's asleep, what he says, um, this, that he was carried through to a certain place towards the right hand, through which no man could pass. It was a place among rocks, very steep and unpassable for water. So this is a very treacherous, dangerous place that he's found himself in, in this vision state. 
And then it goes on and says, um, but once he got past this place, he came to a plane. So he had to go through this this kind of a place. And this is this is um, prophetic, uh, for lack of a better word, because it's kind of talking about what all of us have to go through. Yeah, that's the first thing that came to my mind, the things that we have to go through. You know, we don't just immediately go straight to the plane, though we would want to. We have to... Um, pass through treacherous place you know just just to get to the father we have to go into uh the wilderness yeah you know and then we are brought into the plane and then you have the part where you're purified through pain mm -hmm. we've we done a class on that you guys can look up purified through pain it also comes from uh the book of uh shepherd the uh the shepherd of Hermes similitudes is when you talk about this yeah. this area in which all of us, you know, once we decided to turn towards the Father and become obedient, you know, like Stacy said, it's not something. Everything is not going to go great for us immediately. There's a period of time that we have to go through. That's kind of like what he's describing here: uh, treacherous, unpassable for water. It's not a very pleasant place to be in at all. We're going to we're going to experience that physically. Yeah, and just thinking about it, how, I mean, there's just so much that you can pull out of this book about how you he had to go through these places in order to meet up with uh, things of the divine. Okay. Yeah. Verse 5, And as I was praying, the heaven opened, and I saw the women which I had coveted saluting me from heaven and saying, Hermes, hail. And I, looking upon her, answered, Lady, what dost thou do here? She answered me, I am taking up hither to accuse thee of sin before the Lord. So now we see the lady being carried away. This is the same lady as in one that Hermas was saying that he thought of as a sister that he was admiring. Now he is in this vision, in this dream. And he immediately sees her. And he's like, uh, what are you doing here? And yeah. she says that I have been carried away to the Father to accuse you of a sin that you have committed. Yeah. And this is a lot of the ways our Father, he uses dreams. This is why there's so much confusion when it comes to our dreams. Because he uses people who are uh, contemporary to us. And puts them in positions inside of the dream to have a greater significance. Mm -hmm. So it's like, you know, why is this person here? Why is this person? Why is this person doing that? And why is this person doing this? Um, like I had a husband. I had a dream that my husband was doing such and such. Well, your husband is is just something somebody that's contemporary to you, somebody that you know, but he's representing somebody else in the dream. And so here you have this lady that Hermes knows. She's he's been around her for years. But yet she's going to turn out to be somebody completely and totally different than who Hermes had known her to be before. Yeah, I've heard you do a lot of that in some of your dreams. You it's you see a person and you're wondering, you know, what does this person have to do with my dream? And it's actually that person is just used like a figurehead. Yeah. Um, you know, so a lot of times, you know, when we see things like we see uh, you know, maybe somebody is doing something bad to you. You can't necessarily assume that it's that person. Yeah, no, that'd be yeah. an error. Mm -hmm. That'd be an error. No. Six. Lady, said I, wilt thou convince me? No, she said, but hear the words which I am about to speak unto thee. God who dwelleth in heaven and hath made all things out of nothing and hath multiplied them for his holy church's sake is angry with thee because thou hast sinned against me. So Hermes is uh, asking her, you know, what are you trying to 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 accuse me to the father? And she was saying that, you know, um, the father is angry with, with you because of some of the things that you have said, some of the things that you've done. And we're about to um, see what Hermes has done. But think about it, Hermes has a right to be highly confused because he's like, lady, I ain't never did nothing to you. But again, this is not the lady that he know, he's known all of the time. This is a different representation. He hasn't told her who she is yet. But this ain't that same lady that Hermes has been around all of these many years. Mm -hmm. And that's what she's talking about. The father is angry with you because of something that you have done mm -hmm. uh, against me. 
7. And I answering said unto her, Lady, if I have sinned against thee, tell me where, or in what place, or when did I ever speak an unseemingly or dishonest word unto thee? Okay, that's just like you were saying. It's not necessarily her. Yeah, and so Hermes is he's confused now. Because mm -hmm. he's seeing, like we do in our visions, we're thinking this is the person mm -hmm. who, who, who we're talking to, but it's not. That's just... He's just stuck this other person who is actually being talked about here now has the face of this woman that Hermes knew in a previous you know time of his life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Eight. Have I not always esteemed thee as a lady? Have I not always reverenced thee as a sister? Why dost thou imagine these wicked things against me? So Hermes is confused. He's yeah. wondering why is she accusing him before the father. He's saying that I've always admired you. You know, I've never done anything against you. Why are you accusing me? Yeah, but he actually has done wickedly against this church figure whom she represents. Right. You know, he has done this thing. Um, it's just not just towards this lady, but towards the church as a whole. Mm -hmm. Nine. Then she, smiling upon me, said, The desire of naughtiness has risen upon in thy heart. Does it not seem to thee to be all ill things for a righteous man to have an evil desire rise up in his heart? Okay, so um, he's going through the transition here where he's, he's starting to figure out, Who are you? Why are you saying these things? I ain't never did this kind of stuff. I ain't had nothing to rise up against, you know, you and my heart. You know, I saw you down there by that water coming out, but you was naked. What do you expect? You know what I mean? Um, and so well, he's starting to figure out something else is going on here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. does, Her does Hermes know what he did was wrong? He, he, not yet, because he, he he's not made a connection as to who he's talking to. As far as he's concerned, no, he ain't did nothing wrong. Yeah. Here, we, here you got this naked lady that then came up out of the water. You know what I mean? That ain't nothing to to suffer eternal punishment for. You know what I'm saying? And so he, he's a little bit confused. But this lady who he's talking to is speaking on a much higher level than what Hermes is ready to understand yet. It's not going to be later on that he figures out who it is that he talks to, that what she's saying makes sense. So right now, no, he doesn't He doesn't see what he's done is wrong. Yeah, it seems to me that Hermes is thinking on the physical. And while this lady has moved from the physical and she's on the spiritual side of it. Yeah, yes. well, yeah, or, or she never was on the physical. She she is just the, you know, what's, what this figure in here looks like. But it's not her at all. He's not, he, 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 Hermes at this point will have to make a complete disconnect and says, this is not the lady that we was talking about in verse one. This is somebody T totally different that just only has this, only looks like her, but this is a completely separate entity that we're actually talking about. And he hasn't done that yet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 10. It is indeed a sin and that a very great sin to such a one. For a righteous man thinketh that which is righteous, and whilst he does so, and walketh uprightly, he shall have the Lord in heaven favorable upon him in all his business. So she's helping him to make the connection between that desire that he felt for her down at the water and the way he lives his life in general. Yeah, because we have to remember that Hermes is a righteous and a pious man pious man yeah, just, and it, it's kind of confusing to him and you know he's a little bit bewildered and saying you know you know i'm righteous and she's saying yeah i know that you're righteous but you know righteous men have these thoughts as well yeah now but now this is one of the main parts about the promises that we learn about in this book right here see where it says uh for a righteous man thinketh that which is righteous 
Then it says, and while he does so and walketh uprightly, he shall have the Lord in heaven favorable unto him and all of his business. Mm -hmm. And this is one of the main things that we learned out of the Shepherd of Hermas is that when we are walking uprightly, we will have blessings upon our hands to where we'll be able to, you know, get stuff done in the physical. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Kind of like the Midas touches I refer to it, you know, because, you know, it's like anything you touch turns to gold. Right. You know, if you, whether it be, you know, working on a computer or working on a project or even doing something like this video by walking up right and leave, the father takes, um, takes action in, in what you're doing and helps it to become successful. Yeah. 11. But as for those who think wickedly in their hearts, they take to themselves death and captivity and especially those who love this present world and glory in their riches and regard not the good things that are to come, their souls wander up and down and know not where to fix. So this is talking about how those who have wicked thoughts opposed to those who have righteous things, the opposite happens. Not only are you uh, susceptible to death and captivity, but also you, your soul wanders. Yeah. And it's talking about, you know, the individuals that take pleasure in the riches of this world. Right. So you have these two kinds of people who are being talked about here from 10 to 11. You have ones who have taken pleasure in the things we can see, touch, feel, you know, in our possessions or whatever. While the righteous one is, is focused more on spiritual things. But you notice in 11, like you said, is those who are paying attention to the worldly things. That, you know, what does it say? And regard not the good things that are to come, their souls wander up and down and know not where to fix. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so if we want to be grounded, you know, we've got to take our minds off of the material so much and start thinking, you know, about, about um, the things of heaven. Start thinking about our father and, you know, the things he wants us mm -hmm. thinking about. Yeah, we can't be so captivated what by the things of this world that we neglect the things that are the Father. Yeah, mm -hmm. or, you know, we're going to be like these wanderers out here. And you can see a lot of these people, you know, out here. It doesn't appear so, you know, in your face, so to speak, because, you know, things seem somewhat normal. Mm -hmm. But, you know, as things start to, you know, enter this state of chaos more and more, you're going to notice these people are kind of lost as to what they're supposed to be doing to to help themselves. And it's going, you know, you start see, you know, running to and fro. Some of them getting in trouble for this reason or for that reason because they're not properly grounded in the scripture and what they're actually supposed to be doing when things get hard and rough. Mm -hmm. Twelve. Now, this is the case of such as are double minded, who trust not in the Lord and despise and neglect their own life. Yeah, so it's, it's people who aren't focused on spiritual things, trusting not in the Lord. It says that they're double minded, too. That means they're flip flopping. Yeah, they, they only half believe. They believe, you know, when things are going good, they'll be a believer. As soon as things turn bad, they'll become an unbeliever. Those are people who are double-minded, trust, who trust not in the Lord and despise and neglect their own lives. Yeah. So now this is still making a comparison to Hermas, where he is supposed to be compared to where he actually is. Right. 13. But do thou pray unto the Lord, and he will heal thy sins, and the sins of thy whole house, and of all his saints. So this is, I think this is just general. Well, actually, there's some big promises in here yeah. because yeah, he's mm -hmm. talking about the whole house. I was going to say, this wraps up the whole book. Um, yeah, yeah it's, it generalizes the whole book. It sums up the whole book because it, it ain't just Hermes that is committing these sins. We're going to find out here shortly. Hermes is a good guy, you know, but his biggest problem is, is how he treats his family. You know, he, he loves these guys. In his mind, at least that's the way the scripture says it, he loves these, his children so much that he's allowing them to do wicked stuff. Yeah. Instead of chastising them, putting them in his place, giving them a good old fashioned butt whooping, he's, he's allowing them to do stuff that's wrecking his whole house. Yeah, things that we all do, things that, you know, we, we 
we see our children do, but because we love them so much, we um, we don't discipline them the way that they should be disciplined. It's a bad thing. Yeah, yes, I mean that's what thing. that's why I got Job in trouble. Um, maybe he had done some stuff previously to the to the beginning of the book of Job, but when we're looking in the book of Job, you know. Not without knowing all of the history that we hear about scripture about Job, it seems as though his children are who got him in trouble. Mm -hmm. His three sons were having birthday parties over there, invited his sisters. They all partaking in these birthday parties ended up causing a lot of the pain that came up on Job. Yeah, that also reminds me uh, of David, how his son, one of his sons, um, um, violated his daughter. And David allowed it to, well, he didn't do anything. He didn't take care of it. He didn't do anything about it. And his son, Absalom, went along and, father, he, he killed the guy. Yeah. yeah. So. Because David, you know, he loved his children so much that he didn't do what he was supposed to have done. Yeah. And so that's, that's Hermes' problem. You know, he ain't abusing his family. He's just loving them too much, letting them get away with everything. Mm-hmm. Okay. Fourteen. As soon as she had spoken these words, the heavens were shut, and I remained utterly swallowed up with the sadness and fear, and said within myself, If this be laid against me for sin, how can I be saved? Now, you you talking about stuff of my entire household. If you're going to fault me for stuff that they're doing, how am I ever going to be saved? Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Fifteen. Or how should I ever be able to entreat the Lord for my many and great sins? With what words shall I beseech him to be merciful upon me? So not only is it the stuff that um, he letting his children get away with stuff, but it's the other stuff that he's accused him of too. This, yeah. This, this lady, in the, she's up in the sky looking down from heaven at him right now, right? Yeah, and Hermes is saying, how can I even go to the Father? You know, when I see that word entreat, I always think about how Pharaoh always told Moses to entreat the Lord for me. You know, yeah. after Moses would uh, uh, um, come and tell him what the what thus says the Lord he's about to do, Moses uh, Pharaoh would always say, entreat the Lord for me. So he's telling him, how can I even communicate to the Father? How can I go before the Father, talk to the Father for me is what Pharaoh was telling him. Um, so he's saying, how can I go to the Father and talk to the Father if just these sins are, you know, are against me? Yeah. If, if, how, what chance do I even have? Mm -hmm. You know, I thought sins were more significant than this. This stuff that you talk <laughs> talking to me about, you know. What does beseech mean? Beg. Beg. Fifteen. As I was thinking over these things and meditating in myself upon them, behold, a chair was set over against me of the whitest wool and as bright as snow. So Hermes is still dreaming. Mm -hmm. And his first dream is seems to be in transition. It doesn't seem like he ever woke up or any time has passed, right? Yeah, he just, I mean, that's just like a dream. You know, when you're dreaming, things go from one vision to another and they seem to not be making sense but they always seem to pull together okay. um, so yeah so whereas before in the dream this lady was talking from heaven and but we saw there in that verse that the heavens shut up again and so she's gone but now that he's thinking about it now he sees this uh, this chair mm -hmm. it says uh over against the whitest wool and brightest snow. Very bright chair. 17. And there came an old woman in a bright garment, having a book in her hand, and sat alone, and saluted me, saying, Hermes, hail. And I began full of sorrow and weeping, answering, Hail, lady. So, now he's actually seeing a what he thinks is a different lady. Mm -hmm. He he does he's not he's going to be a while before he puts together that this woman that he saw up in the clouds talking to him is the same lady that he's now seeing 
down on the earth mm -hmm. where he's at. Yeah, and she is uh, about to start speaking to him, and um, Hermes is over there crying. Yeah, he's yeah he's crying, crying. and weeping. Yeah, because he thinks you know there's no way for him to be saved after he's been accused from heaven in such a manner. Mm -hmm. So now you got this lady that comes up and she's ready to to communicate with him. Eighteen. And she said unto me, Why art thou sad, Hermes, who wert wont to be patient and modest and always cheerful? I answered and said unto her, Lady, a reproach has been laid to my charge by an excellent woman who tells me that I have sinned against her. So he's talking to her as if she's somebody different, but he's still obviously still dreaming. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 19. She replied, Far be any such thing from the servant of God, but it may be the desire of her has risen up in thy heart. For indeed such a thought maketh the servant of God guilty of sin. So she's telling him that, you know, you did have this desire in your heart and that, you know, though you are a servant of God, you are guilty of the sin. Yeah, she's kind of playing along with the fact that he he doesn't know who she is. Mm -hmm. and so he's like, well, maybe he sees, he sees him there crying. And she, he's, Hermes is like, um, the reason why I'm crying is because this excellent woman has you know, said these things against me. And uh, this, this lady now is like, well, maybe you did do something wrong. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. 20. Nor ought such a detestable thought to be in the servant of God, nor should he who is approved by the Spirit desire such which is evil, but especially Hermes, who contains himself from all wicked lust, and is full of all simplicity and of great innocence. So, go ahead. I was just going to say said that, you know, she was saying, uh, you know, but she said, not, not such a detestable thought be to a servant of God, but especially not you, Hermes. Yeah, because Hermes was a good guy. Mm -hmm. You know, that's why he was given the opportunity to write this book in the first place. He wasn't just some random heathen, you know, just going through life and all of a sudden he got this just vision. He was also, he was already a very pious individual anyway. He's mentioned in there by Paul in the, in the um, I forgot what book it is. is. That Paul salutes him mm -hmm. um, as a scribe or as some type of. He was uh, a companion, yeah. yeah. He was a companion, or um, yeah, of of not only Paul but Peter and all of those guys. Yeah, yeah. but it's necessary to bring out his faults, even though they may be, you know, minor in comparison to you know all else that was going around. But the important thing is that Hermes got this information. For the soul sake of being able to write this book, you know, so now we're going to bring out some of the details of Hermes's life and help him to get straight in those areas just so we can identify the problems that we all have. Like I said, we're all like a Hermes, so we're all going to have these these different flaws in our life, but they're going to bring Hermes's out and going to lay them out on the table so he can write this book. All right. 21. Nevertheless, the Lord is not so much angry with thee for thine own sake, as upon the account of thy house, which has committed wickedness against the Lord and against their parents. So, Hermes, like I said, he's getting in trouble. He's in trouble for the actions of his household. Yeah, not only his children, but later on we're going to talk about some of the um, actions of his wife. Yeah, you know. his whole household, everybody under there. If, if you could imagine this, in some environments, he would have people that weren't related to him under his household, too. Yeah, you know, a lot of times you hear people say things such as, if the head is wicked, then the, the whole body is wicked. But here, you know, it's the other way around. The body is doing things that are wrong, therefore making the head wicked. You you know, know. Making the head have to pay. Yeah. In, in a normal situation, you could imagine that Hermes could somehow be, quote, saved while the rest of his family can suffer. Um, and you 
when you listen to you know a lot of people they kind of think like that now they think that they're going to be all right even though their children are sinners or, or you know some people in their household are sinners you know you can hit up about that kind of stuff especially in church environments mm-hmm. um where the people will come in and they'll talk about how they're righteous but those they left back at the house are sinners their husband their children or whatever well what we're talking about now is this tower and you know this is the earlier the quicker we understand about this tower in the shepherd of hermits that this is what it's talking about this tower of people who will go on to the kingdom age we understand that we go as a family group hermits will do no good by himself standing there in a uh, in the kingdom of heaven by itself it would actually be a little bit more detrimental than if he were to have his whole family with him you know he got his wife he got his kids he got his grandkids they show up ready to go into the kingdom of heaven as a group opposed to some single man by himself you know do we find him a wife now you know what do we do with this guy that's sitting over by himself you know where's the rest of his family okay so now you're gonna have to because you know you might throw off people by saying or that we're talking about the tower we're not talking about Hermas is going to be have a wife and children, you know, together up in heaven and all that kind of stuff. Whatever. Yeah, Hermas already has a wife and children, but we we understand that you know the reason why Hermas is being taught all of these things is so he can live unto God, and what that's talking about is actually living through the tribulation and surviving to the kingdom of heaven. That's what this whole book is about. How do you survive the tribulation? And, and be standing around after the tribulation is over, not, you know, in the spirit world, not in, quote, heaven looking down on everybody, not as a newborn baby that can't do nothing. How are you going to be, have you, are you going to have the strength, the knowledge, and the wisdom of, and the wisdom and understanding in order to be a significant player in the kingdom of heaven? There's still going to have to be stuff that's going to get done over there. You know, who is it going to be? You know, is it? Is it going to be you or not? You know, if you're going to be thrust off into the spirit world, that's not going to be you. Well, that's what this whole book is about, is how is it that Hermes and his entire family is going to be alive, just like Noah's family was after the tribulation and the apocalypse is over. Mm-hmm. 22. And for that out of thy fondness towards thy sons, thou hast not admonished thy house but has permitted them to live wickedly. And for this cause the Lord is angry with thee, and he will heal all the evils that are done in thy house. For through their sins and iniquities thou art wholly consumed in secular affairs. Yeah, so he's he may be watching over himself, but he's not taking care of his family spiritually as he should be. Yeah, he's not, um, I would say he's not diligent about taking care of their spiritual needs, about, he's seeing some of the iniquity that they're doing, yet he's allowing, allowing he's allow- it? Yeah, he's allowing it. Um, I, I found myself in this position, you know, not so many years ago, where, you know, I made chest, like, I, like I'm thinking of one child of mine, I'm not going to name him, but, you know, there was some idolatry going on in his household. And I had mentioned the idolatry, you know, and told him about it, reminded him of it. But then when I visited him and his house, um, there was the idolatry. You know, so what did I do? Did I throw a fit and say, you know, I told you you ain't supposed to have this on the wall and start taking stuff down? Or did I... Um, Allow him to remain in it. Or, yeah, just don't say nothing. Just try to keep the peace or yeah, whatever the peace. in that environment. Mm-hmm. Not so much as saying, uh, hey, son, what's that? You know, or, you know, making any, any confrontation on it whatsoever. You know, in a lot of ways, I was like Hermes where, you know, I just ignored it. And it was a lot of stuff going on. You know, when we visited that, that son, there was a lot of stuff going on like that, that, you know, I didn't confront him on it. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, if he was living inside of my household, would I have confronted him? If I didn't confront him and allowed him to continue those acts inside of my household, now I am putting my whole house in jeopardy. Right. 
So if the one of your sons or daughters doesn't actually live with you, are they still a part of your house? I don't think so. You know, I don't think as far as the context of what we're talking about here, they I treat them like they do, you know, but is is it, you know, see, the promises of our kids that are outside of our house is that they're going to continue to live the lifestyle that they are living until there's some type of divinely inspired event that changes their mind. In other words, the father is going to change their mind. It's not going to be me. I'm not going to all of a sudden, you know, have a great conversation in my mind that I'm going to call them up. And once I tell them these few words, they're going to repent of everything they did, you know, and want to do right. That's not in the eschatology. The eschatology is, is that they're going to go continue, you know, doing what they're doing. And then something's going to happen outside of their control, outside of my control. That's going to make them realize the error in their ways. Whether it be an earthquake, you know, whether it be, you know, just something. I can't imagine what it would, it would, it would definitely be on an individual basis. There's something out there for that individual son or that individual daughter that when they see that thing, they're going to say, hey, I need to act right. But that's a little, um, I don't know, it's a little confusing for me because I'm thinking, you know, when a, when a man and a woman come together... Uh, scripture tells us that they become one flesh and they leave their mother and father. But then again, we go back to the example of Job, who uh, children were obviously outside of his home, I believe. Yeah. But yet and still he got into um, trouble because of some of the things that they were participating in. And then we look at this book where uh, Hermit's children, we don't know, I don't know if it states that they were outside of his home or not. But they were obviously committing some iniquities, and the father is uh, telling Hermes that he will have to be responsible for that too. So are we responsible for one way or the other? Are we sort of still, though we're still their parents, are we responsible still for the iniquities that our children are doing even though they're outside of our home? Yeah, I mean, we're all responsible because we raised them. You know, if we'd have raised them right... And we wouldn't be worried about they'd be out there. They would be, you know, they would be doing the right thing no matter where they are, they are at. But you know, the lifestyle that they've chosen to lead now is the result of their upbringing, mm-hmm. and it is the result of us being like this hermit here and allowed them to get away with stuff when they were living inside of our home. And now that they're outside of our home, it's just pronounced. Now they're just doing whatever they want to do, right? But. The thing about it, you know, what we're learning and what we're going to learn in Hermes that, you know, it's up to Hermes to get himself straight first. Hermes is going to be the first one to get straightened out, even though he's considered a very good dude already. Now, the few errors that he has are going to go away. Then it's going to go from from Hermes is going to spread to his wife next. Then it's going to spread to the children who are inside of the house. Then it's going to spread to the children of outside of the house. Yeah, we start working down from the head, you know, then to the wife, then to the children, and then, you know, those outside of the home. Because it's necessary that the entire family group goes. You know, the promises, like we talked about those promises, if um, in order for me to survive, all of you guys are going to survive too. You know, you're, we're all going to go into the kingdom of heaven as a family group. And I do believe that includes the children that are grown and gone. And outside of the house, they're going to come back to the house and be standing there, you know, looking pretty humbled at that point. But they're still going to be standing there ready to go into the kingdom of heaven with the rest of us. Mm-hmm. You know, we may put the youngest children in charge of them. Like you watch your other bro, older brother and make sure you don't do nothing stupid. But, you know, he's still going to be there. Just with some catching up to do. Yeah, and we were talking about this the other day how um, it really wasn't the children really weren't weren't supposed to leave the house. You know, we when we think of the parable that the Messiah gave of uh, the, the 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 young lad that left his father's home and went off to the city, that was a bad thing. You know, the children actually were supposed to stay at the house and be one unit 
where it just works together. You know, that one family is supposed to form a community that, you know, get things done. And, and, you know, all of their lives is centered around the kingdom of God. Well, that's part of the Babylonians and Egyptian culture that we live in now, where, you know, at the age of 18, we're expected to leave the house or to put that child out of the house. That's Babylonians. That's the way they live. You know, at 18, you go form your own. Whereas any other community, even the communities that are still surviving, that are not Babylonians, you look around the world, they still don't send their children away. They, they you know, you have five generations of people living in the same, under the same roof. Yeah. Definitely within a close vicinity of each other. Mm-hmm. Nobody packs up and just moves off into the city. Yeah. And that's that's Babylonians. That that part is going away too. 23. But now the mercy of God hath taken compassion upon thee and upon thy house, and hath greatly comforted thee. Only as for thee, do not wander, but be of an even mind, and comfort thy house. Okay, now this, he's talking about how the father is giving them a chance and this is extremely important for us to understand you know you know as we evolve spiritually in this thing that is not by our choice even even our family can't point back to a day and say we decided we was going to live righteously um, and we were going to do the right thing and you know we lived happily ever after no it is always the father who sees your heart sees where you're at and decides to give you the opportunity to do right yeah for our benefit it's not for his benefit it's totally for our benefit that we're given this choice uh to start start over again and the thing about it is not that much of a choice it seems like a choice but he puts us on the right path you know to the point and, and it seems like a choice because I say that because it seems like, okay, we're following the path, but how much of a choice was it when you couldn't see the other path anymore? Mm-hmm. You couldn't see that wrong path that you were on. That job went away. That girlfriend went away. Whatever it was that was keeping you on the wrong path is no longer available to you. So are you making the choice or not? Was it chosen for you? And I believe that's what the Father does for us in this time is that he puts us on the right path. Right. It's his choice, not ours. And that's what he's doing. That's what he's telling Hermes here. I could have left you out there. You know, I could have I could have let it be so that, you know, your your family stayed on the path that they were on. You stayed on the path that you were on. Chances are all of you guys would have ended up in the spirit world. You would have got incarnated, you know, going forward. Everything would have been happy and good. But I'm putting you on the right path, giving you certain chances that maybe the rest of the world don't have. Yeah, his mercy. His mercy, yeah. That's why that scripture says, you know, that no man can boast. You can't really boast and say, you know, it's because of your thoughts, your actions that you are now, that you now have a chance to go into the kingdom of heaven. Because if he had never put you on that path, you wouldn't even know where the path was. Right. Mm-hmm. 24. As the workman bringing forth his work opposite to whomsoever he pleaseth. So shalt thou be teaching every day what is just. Cut off a great sin. Wherefore cease not to admonish thy sons. For the Lord knows that they will repent with all their heart. And they shall be written in the book of life. Yeah, so continue to teach um, the children. Pecking away at the flaws that they have. You know, it's not going to change overnight. Yeah. Yeah. Not going to be like, you know, everybody doing wrong, we're about to do right. Mm-hmm. And then it's going to, you know, be over with. You, yeah. you, you're going to have to continue. What do you say? Teach every day what is just. Yeah. And 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 show it. Yeah. Be yeah, an example mm-hmm. of what it means to do right. And when you see somebody else doing wrong, you, you know, you coach them in that moment. You know, find a way to say it to where it doesn't, you know, Offend, offend, yeah, them. offend them too much to where they like I don't want to have nothing to do with it but it makes them feel like they want to you know do, do the right thing on their own yeah and he said they will eventually repent and eventually eventually start uh, walking 
righteously and their names also shall be written in the book of life yeah and they will they will repent i could be i could tell you firsthand you know it may seem early on that you know there's no hope for these guys you know yourself included but as you continue to you know make small progressions every day you eventually start to see the effect on everybody around you you know and it starts to look like yeah these 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 guys are gaining this repentant heart same way I did and so then all of us can be written in this book of life we can all go on to this higher this, this kingdom of heaven that's what he's talking about when he says the, the book of life I, I believe that those whose names are written in the book of life will be the only ones who live and go into the kingdom of heaven in the flesh the other ones will have to be reincarnated mm -hmm. Twenty five. And when she had said this, she added unto me, Wilt thou hear me read? I answered her, Lady, I will. So now she's about to read in this book. So what's what's been going on so far? Hermes fell asleep and found himself, you know, going through this vision state, this this rough terrain, and then he found himself in a plane and the sky opened up and now you got this lady who's chastising him. For some, he don't really understand yet. Mm -hmm. It's obviously that he don't know who this lady is. She's uh, maybe she looks different because um, but, or he never looked up at her. Remember, he was crying and sobbing, had his head down and stuff. Right. Mm -hmm. So and she definitely looked different. We're gonna find out later that he's that she looked older. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so now she's about to start reading to him from some book, and yep. she asked him, you know. Would you be willing to allow me to read? And Hermes saying, is saying yes. Okay. I will listen. So a very important part of this is this book that she's going to read from. All right, Johnny. Twenty six. Here then, she said, and opening the book, she read gloriously, greatly, and wonderfully, such things as I could not keep in my memory. For they were terrible words, such as no man could bear. So here's the first part of the book. Hermes can't even hear it. It's so bad. Mm. This is the, we're going to find out later that he was talking to, you know, two different people. One part in the first part of the book. And then she's talking to, a, she's talking to us only in the second part of the book. Right. You imagine all of the rough things that she was saying in there. Mm -hmm. 27. How it be I committed her last words to my remembrance, for they were but few and of great use to us. Okay, so the second part of the book is a smaller part of the book, but Hermes is actually able to hear and remember those words. So did he write down any of the second part? Of the first part? Yeah, the first part of the book? No, he didn't. He wasn't even able to, to understand it. So have you read anything or researched anything? Have... Anybody, um, or do anybody know of any the things that were written down in the first? No, she only gives us a hint here, very it, it, down here. Um, she gives us a hint as to what they are. Yeah. But no, you, those parts are gone. Mm -hmm. Those parts are written for those people who aren't going to be standing, you know, around anyway. You know, like I told you before, and some people tend to try to get offended when I say this, but the the Bible is written for those who plan to inherit the earth and go on you know it's not really written for the everyday person i know you'll argue and say yeah it's written for everybody but it's written for everybody that wants to do the right thing you know those who don't want to do the right thing no this this ain't really for you mm -hmm. and so those group those other parts that he didn't understand that was the part that was for them 28 behold the mighty lord who by his invisible power and with his excellent wis wisdom made the world and by his glorious counsel beautified his creature and with the word of his strength fit fixed the heaven and founded the earth upon the waters and by his powerful virtue established the holy church which he has blessed. Okay, so this is our establishing who our father is. Who is this mighty Lord that we're talking about? Mm -hmm. I was just thinking how she was giving um, like introduction or praises to the father for who he is. Yeah. 
and identifying him. You know, that's why you hear, you know, a lot of people, when they try to make it clear who they're talking about, they'll say, our Father in Heaven, who created the stars and the earth, you know, they, they you, know, you know, and I believe that's what she's doing here, just mm -hmm. making sure we know who, who he is and how to identify him. Mm -hmm. 29. Behold, he will remove the heavens and the mountains and the hills, and the seas, and all things shall be made plain for his elect, that he may render upon them the promise which he has promised, which much honor and joy. If so be that they shall keep the commandments of God, which they have received with great faith. So once again, he's um, just talking about the greatness of the Father. Yeah, but he's talking about um, what he's going to do for his elect now. And his elect being those who keep the commandments. Right? You see that? Mm -hmm. If so be that they shall keep the commandments which they have received with great faith. He's saying what he's going to do for these people. And notice what he says. He's going to remove the heavens and the mountains and the hills and the seas. And all things shall be made plain. I believe this is he's talking about this huge earthquake, like like we read in the scripture the other day, it's going to shake down every building. It is after this day. So you have to understand the whole last Trump deal. That's why we get so many classes on when is the last Trump, because all of this happens right simultaneously or right before the last Trump. During the last Trump, we have a global earthquake that's going to shake down every wall on the planet. Mm -hmm. Well, after that shake down, after those buildings are shaken down, it's then we're, when we're going to get this equality again. You know, that's when things are going to be made plain. Whereas now, see, that, that's, that's what the average materialistic worldly person has over you is their possessions. You know, when they can show up in their Jordans driving their... Uh, late model car and living in their home, you know, there's air conditioned and, you know, uh, all of this, you know, is, is, is refrigerator full of food puts them in a position where they can look down their nose at you and says, you know, why would I want to at all uh, embrace the teachings that you follow if it's going to in any way lead me to live in a lifestyle that's like yours. Yeah. But once you strip all of their stuff away. Mm -hmm. And strip all of your stuff away. And now y'all both sitting there in a pile of rubble where you can't tell whose stuff from whose. Equal. Equal. Now you're equal. Now it's all equal. You right. know? And, and so that's what he's talking about where he says, made plain for his elect that he may render unto them the promises which he has promised. And that is that we will become the head, whereas now we are the tail. And, you know. The hump, the, the shaking down of the building is what's going to equalize everything. But then going forward from that point, you got these people who understand cleanliness laws. They understand dietary laws. They understand the laws of nature. They even understand the uh, laws of um, agriculture. And, you know, they're able to throw my hand quotes up, please the agricultural gods to make stuff grow up out of that ground. That's what's going to um Elevate these people while the other people still waiting for the Walmart trucks to start running again or waiting for, you know, Bob the Builder to come and rebuild their house. This other group is elect. They didn't already learn. No, you're going to have to build your own house. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. right. and I was just thinking about, you know, at that time, you know, you're going to be separated. Those who's at a lowly position now um, will be separated uh, and put on a more higher status, you know, just for instance, for, take for instance that, you know, all of this happened and both of you are sitting there equally in a pile of rubble and someone comes along and say, okay, I need somebody who has some skills to do a certain thing. And you raise your hand and say, well, you know, I know how to uh, plant a garden or I know how to quilt or I know how, uh, you know, I don't know, milk cows or whatever, and then you got this other person that says, well, you know, I know how to tally numbers, you know, what's going to be more valuable at that time? Yeah. The person who knows how to plant a garden or the yeah. person who 
who works in a, for an accounting firm and knows how to tally numbers. Yeah, and, and you learn that through all throughout Scripture that you had, okay, these 12 tribes of Israel, but each one of those tribes had their own particular job. One was in charge of security, one was in charge of fishing, one was in charge of carpentry, I think Benjamin was in charge of philosophy or something like that. But you had each one of you. One of them would have been a hunter. Priest. And you know, one of them would have been. Yeah, definitely one of them was a priest. And so that's the way it's going to be, you know, going forward after this apocalypse, where you're going to have people with different talents and abilities that's going to show up to add to the community, so that the community can once again start to strive again. Whereas that other group, you know, what are you good at? I'm good at telling people what to do. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm a, I was a supervisor. Yeah, I was, yeah. Okay. Like, okay. Tell people what to do. We'll sit over there. We'll find something for you to do here in a minute. As for right now, you know, we need the doers up here to do stuff. Somebody got to build this out. Yeah. Are the tribes ever gonna come back together? Um, spiritually, yeah. Spiritually, yeah. We're, when we will have a connection between each other, but that that connection will only be spiritual. Just like you have some people over here in this part of Alabama. You're going to have our brothers spiritually connected in Arizona or Milwaukee or somewhere. Mm -hmm. But that's the only connection is that it will be. That's that's will be reunited in him, not reunited physically, but reunited in him. And, you know, we all celebrate together on feast days and all of that. Thirty. And when she had made an end of reading. She rose out of the chair, and behold, four young men came and carried the chair to the east. Oh, now, now I, she don't even read the, the book in this part, does she? She doesn't read the book until uh, part three. Yeah, she does read the book, I remember, yeah. In part three. Mm -hmm. She doesn't read it in vision one. Right. So we'll be covering that on in a future class. So you guys make sure you hit that subscribe button or that bell notification button when you see that video come out. Um, that'll be in Vision 3, which is the main part of this this uh, series here. We're starting back in Vision 1, but I think it's so we can um, uh, uh, introduce, introduce plus get a little warmed up, you know, because, you know, Vision 3 is going to be the real, real big class. Mm -hmm. But then that's when she'll read in that book. All right. Or oh, tell us what she read in the book. She actually read it over here, but we won't know what's in the book until Vision 3. 31 and she called me unto her and touched my breast and said unto me did my reading please thee I answered lady these last things pleased me but what went before was severe and hard so now we have done videos on this reading before if you Look for a class called Message to the Elect or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, if you, anybody wanted to jump ahead and see what that reading was that she's talking about. 32. She said unto me, These last things are for the righteous, but the foregoing for the revolters and the heathen. All right. So you were saying, did she ever tell what was in the first part of the book? This is the only thing. That you know, the part that he didn't understand was for the revolters and for the heathen, rebellers, rebellious ones. Well, it did not. It didn't say he didn't understand. He just don't remember them. Well, no. he didn't remember them, right? Let's see what he said up there. And I'm thinking that they were because they were so bad, you know. What it says, uh, but she read gloriously, greatly, and wonderfully such things as I could not keep in my memory, for they were terrible words, such as no man could bear. So he just couldn't remember them. Thirty-three. And as she was talking with me, two men appeared and took her upon their shoulders and went to the east where the chair was. Go ahead. I was going to say, you want to explain the significance of the east? Well, the east, I believe, is just talking about, you know, how certain people like Solomon tried to make it to where we would get extra credit in our prayers if we pray towards the east. But... Here, I think there's a more significance on the fact of who is actually taking this lady away. Here you have two oh, yeah. men that appeared mm -hmm. and took her up on, her up on their shoulders and went towards the east. Now, we're going to hear a lot about these two these men here. A lot of times it's going to be uh, six of them 
and then at one point it's going to be 10,000 or more of these individuals so they would just be angels mm -hmm. two of the six mighty angels yeah and we know part of them is Michael Finael Raphael Uriel Gabriel and it very well could be Uriel, who is the angel of repentance. He could very well be one of these, and Michael could be the other. We don't know. Yes. Don't, but we do know they are important. These two men who are carrying hair off are of importance. Mm -hmm. We'll find out later in the story how important they get. Okay. But they took her up on their shoulders and went to the east where the chair was. So you have the chair. So is this the same chair that Hermes was seeing before? I believe so. She hasn't sat in the chair at all. She's going to sit in the chair later on. Yeah, she's going to sit in the chair later on. So he so he just been carried over to, okay, that makes mm -hmm. sense that they're just taking her over where the chair is at. And then the story will continue because Hermes is going to end up over there with her and they're going to have more conversation. Yeah, and, you know, later on it's going to explain to us why she's sitting in the chair. Yeah. Yeah, so. All right. 34. And she went cheerfully away, and as she was going, said unto me, Hermes, be of good cheer. Be of good cheer. So he's about to wake up. That was his first dream. His mm -hmm. first dream is over. And um, so he's about to wake up. Mm -hmm. All right. So that's going to conclude us in Vision 1. Anything else anybody want to say before we finish complete with Vision 1? Well, I want to just thank the kids for um, remaining and participating. It was good to have them to um, join in with this class. Or this join in with us with this class. I think that they learned a lot, and you know, not only did they learn, but they learned how to conduct the class as well. Hmm. They might be further coaches. Oh yeah, in the future. <laughs> yeah, the coaches of the future. <laughs> all right, that sounds good to me. I, all right, um, anybody else? All right, now I'll just say that that's Division 1. Um, it kind of starts off slow, but, you know, that's the slowest uh, chapter out of this entire book. It's going to pretty much get pretty rapid, you know, from here on as far as, you know, the knowledge, wisdom, and understanding that's going to come out of this. So be sure to stay tuned for Vision 1 and Vision 3 of The Shepherd of Hermes. And if you want, you can get jump ahead and jump over and listen to the second book classes that we've done called Commands, you can jump over and look into the playlist we've done on all of the similitudes. Um, I think it took 13 classes to do that. Or you can even go read the book for yourself. Right. There, there's even an audio book that you can listen to uh, that covers the Shepherd of Hermes. Uh, you can listen to it in about four hours. Mm -hmm. All right, and then in next vision two, what is he going to talk about and again? His neglect of correcting his talkative wife Ooh. and his lewd sons. Uh -oh. Okay, but seriously though, for those who are going through the same things that Hermes is experiencing, this book will be a great help. Um, I don't want to pick on anybody, but you do notice that part where he says talkative wives and his lewd sons. So, um, we really need to pay close attention to this this kind of stuff because it tells us how to how to handle these these people, especially our uh, talkative wives. The um, suggestions on how to handle those situations may surprise you. So be sure to pay attention to um, the rest of this mini series on uh, Visions One, and go ahead and check out uh, the second part of the series called Commands, and the third part of the series, which is the similitudes of the Shepherd of Hermas. Well, I guess this is Shalom. Goodbye. See Shalom. ya. Bye.